There's a story here from Jason Jordan called Take It Off. Without her knowing, Mark posted the video. A million views meant he had to show it to her before someone else did. What's interesting is some people think that's perverted and some people don't think it's not. So kind of, you know, I guess really shows your own uh, thinking. So uh, finally, let's read one more. Uh, Bruce Harris, play ball. Ninth inning, bases loaded, two out. Cody looks at a third called strike. He's petrified to look at his father. But what do you want to know? How about we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> just open up to, uh, to a Q&A. Where do you start? Where do you start? Uh, well, depending on what it is you want to do, probably write a book first. No, I mean, That's your... assuming you've already finished your piece. Um, Basically, I always say with, uh, in terms of self-publishing, just because you can doesn't mean you should. So there's a lot, you know what I mean? Like I could easily go home tonight and self-publish, you know, one of my trunk novels. You know, it doesn't mean I necessarily should do that. You always got to make sure it's as perfect as it can be, if that makes sense. Um, a, lot of, a, a lot of writers I know who do this, you know, they make sure they hire, you know, professional editors, proofreaders, graphic designers. I mean... It adds up because there's initial costs, but what happens is after you kind of recoup that cost, everything else is pure profit because there's no overhead with eBooks. It's you know you could sell 100 as opposed to say a paperback, where like um, let's see here, like say with a paperback, you know if I wanted to order copies, it's going to cost however much to order it. It's going to cost the shipping. It's going to cost whatever else. And you know, the very, very small margins. Say I want to then, like the other day, I, I mailed some books off to the UK. The shipping costs more than the book. So I try not to send stuff out of country as much as possible, unless they're paying the extra money because it's like, it's just, it's not worth it. Um, so that's the kind of the nice thing about it, at least in terms of digital, because um, it's like a level playing field. Uh, technically, say you were to upload a novel, um, tomorrow you would have the same p potential distribution as Stephen King. Um, Print-wise, no. Because, you know, there's bookstores or whatever else. So, like, I mean, if, if, if I was just, in terms of my own career, if I was just depending on selling these, I wouldn't even bother. But because e-books is a lot, you know, the, the distribution is basically a level playing field. And, um, Basically, the royalty rate is much better than so. So, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. So, do you think eventually print will be obsolete? I don't think print will be obsolete. I mean, there's always going to be a place for print. I think that ebooks are kind of like the new mass market paperback. You know, mass market paperbacks are the ones that you go into CVS or Walmart and see. I think those are going to be going away. Um, publishers are going to concentrate more on hardcover and trade paperback just because. They can earn more money back on that, and of course, ebooks. They're keeping ebook royalty rate at twenty-five percent, so they're making a killing off that. So, any other questions? <laughs> so you you've written your novel. You've had an editor look at it. Yeah. You have somebody who did the graphic design. Yeah. And, and, and proofread it and right. yeah, make, make sure it's one hundred percent. Right. It's good to go. And they spelled your name right. And they spelled my name right. That's that, <laughs> that, that's very important too. So you have all that down. Now what? Like that's, I guess, what, that's why I said, like, where do you start? Like, when? Well, um, basically, there is um, Amazon. They have a thing called KDP, which is um, Kindle Direct Publishing or Platform. But basically, basically it's called KDP. Uh, Nook has Nook Press, uh, Kobo, Kobo Writing Life. Um, Google has just Google Play. I don't think there's an actual name for it. And then there's iTunes, just has regular iTunes for iBooks. Um, you basically, um, also assuming that you have it formatted for like an EPUB or a Mobi for Kindle, you just basically upload, uh, upload the files, you know, input your own data, product description, all that good stuff, that and good to go. Oh, it's very easy. It's almost, it's almost too easy. Wow. It, it is almost too easy. That's why I always say, just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should, because it literally is very simple. Like, there are times where uh, my most recent, actually the one I was going to read, because um, I've been re uh, releasing a lot of just like single short stories, is like 99 cent ebooks. Um, 
I uploaded it, and within a couple hours, it was ready to go. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's so insane. Is it kind of like a maybe like an eBay account where say someone purchases it and then you get transferred funds? Uh, what happens is, at least for me, um, each platform has my banking info, right. and after royalty rates usually kick in after 60 days. So after 60 days, basically, I get paid monthly. So at the end of every month, I get an email saying, you know, this money has been deposited into your account. Right. And that's, that's really that. One thing to take into account, though, is it is really considered self-employment. So you have to keep in mind that 30% of what comes in has to go back out to the IRS, which is not fun at all. Yeah. So say for like a 99 cent ebook, what are your, what are your returns on that? Um, at this point, most of the platforms are set that between 299 and 999, you get a 70 to a 60% royalty rate. Anything below that could be a 35 to 40%. So for a 99 cent ebook, I make like 35 cents. For a 499 ebook, I can make like about 350, mm -hmm. and, and that's per unit. So yeah, the margin is much nicer. Have you experienced any issues with uh, like piracy and copyright? Oh yeah, my stuff's all over pirate websites. I don't care. I know a lot of writers who freak out, yeah. but I'm like, I don't know. I think there's more things to get worried about right. than that. I don't, I don't really think it's hurting sales. I figure people who go on pirate websites, they're not going to buy anything anyway. So you don't, you don't see it as lost profits? No. If yeah, anything, it's free advertising. Right. I know Neil Gaiman had always said that, you know, piracy actually, like, you know, helped him. You know, he put a novel out for free and his print sales went up because of it. So. Do you, is there any market, like, you seem to be focused mostly on the digital media. Is, say if you were to self-publish and you, Sounds like you might want to maybe start with, um, you know, like Amazon or, or one of those platforms. But is there really any any market or any value in, in also publishing it in print? Um, there's people who like print. Uh, in terms of Amazon, they're they have this thing that when they get linked up, it will show kind of like the print price versus the Kindle price. So it'll say like, oh, you have a savings of, you know, seventy percent. And so that actually, you know. I don't want to say tricks, but you know, kind of tricks some people into thinking like, "Ooh, huge savings! I want to buy this Kindle edition." Uh, there's that. I mean, I have some audiobooks too. I like audiobooks. Um, that costs a lot more to produce because you're basically paying a voice actor to record the entire book, and then you know, there's the cost of having it edited and whatever else. So, um, and recently, the one company that does that, ACX that was doing 50% royalties, moved it back now to 40% royalties. So I don't, I, don't, I don't like that. You can't do your own voice recording? You can, but the thing is, how are you going to upload it? Um, ACX is the one that basically would go to iTunes and Audible. And Audible basically has the market corner, because they're like the only, besides them and iTunes, they're like the only places where you can buy at least digital um, audiobook. If you were to try to put everything on CD, Again, it's kind of like with print. That would cost way too much. It wouldn't really be worth it. How do you publicize things once you self-publish them? Do you do it all through your own website oh, yeah. and social media and things? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Social media, you know, if I have a new thing out, I'll, you know, I'll mention it. But I don't, like, say all the time. Like, you know, there's some people who every hour say, buy my book. I don't know, I feel with social media, it's always good to sell by not selling, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just kind of there, you know. You know, if people kind of care what you're saying, then they'll care more into maybe possibly looking at your stuff as opposed to just saying, you know, be a constant advertisement. Um, there are places like, um, if anybody uh, subscribes, there's the Kindle Daily Deal kind of uh, thing. That's something that Amazon basically is able to control themselves, but there's another uh, service called BookBub and several other services like that that basically are targeted emails that go out to people who subscribe. I mean, these people sign up, you know, they say they like certain types of genres, whatever else, and they get an email notifying them when uh, a book is like 99 cents or however much, and um, BookBub is kind of at the forefront of it 
because they've really grown. I mean, they've gotten investors like, I forget how much they're worth, like over like a million. I mean, they have like almost two million subscribers. So of course, the more subscribers they have, the more they can charge for advertising. I had actually used them for this book, Serial Killer's Wife, and that's how I had hit the USA Today bestseller list. Because, you know, just having that presence, that advertising presence, really getting in front of, you know, all these hundreds of thousands of people, they might not buy the book, but at least they see that, you know, the book exists, assuming, of course, that they actually open the email. I mean, I think a lot of people will sign up for stuff. I know, like, my own newsletter, you know, I think you have, like, a typically, even not across the board, is, like, below 50% usually open rate. So say, you know, 10,000 people sign up, you might be lucky if 5,000 people actually open up your newsletter. So, so I mean, besides that, though, and, of course, Amazon, um, you know, if you get lucky with their algorithm, you know, in terms of, you know, customers who bought this also bought that, uh, that really helps too. So. All right. Do you want to read your short story? Do I? <laughs> I don't want to keep everyone here. I'm sure everyone has other things to do. All right. So I wrote this um, for a writer who uh, a long time ago had uh, published a thing called uh, The Horror Show, which was one of the first like horror magazines back in I think it was the seventies, maybe eighties. Like a lot of like Dean Koontz, he had published like a lot of like uh, you know at the time up and coming writers who had become very established were published there. So um, he and I had been friends for the, I mean he passed away like two years ago, and there was a publisher who was going to put out a tribute anthology almost immediately. So they're like we need stories, you know. So they put together this stuff, and now it's been like a year and a half and it hasn't even come out yet. So finally I said screw it, I'm going to really release it myself. So I dedicated it to him, and uh, the most. I think the most self-serving thing a writer can do is write a story about writers. So this is a story about writers. Um, not only that, it's actually about me fictionalized. So that's fun too. It all makes sense. So anyway, uh, it's called Muse. And if we get to a point where you just are like, just stop reading, just let me know. So <laughs> trust me, it's where, fine. Where, where is this available? Uh, this is that 99 cent ebook thing that I recently uh, released. Okay. Um, because it's supposed to be in an anthology, and maybe someday it will be. But I, I mean, like I said, it's been like a year and a half since, since I signed the contract, and I was like, you know what? I'm tired of sitting on it. That's another thing, too, in terms of self-publishing. Um, you start losing patience. Like selling a book to a major publisher, you're waiting like a year or two before the book comes out. You know, it's completely out of your hands. Here, it's like, you know, I have something ready to go. Why am I going to sit on it? So uh, anyway, the story is called Amuse. They kept me locked in the interrogation room for nearly three hours before the detectives came in. They apologized at once. They said there had been a development in the case that they needed to follow up on immediately. Like what? I asked. We found more bodies. This was from Detective Percy, who took a seat across from me at the table. The other one, Detective Huston, lingered sullenly back near the door like he probably saw in every cop drama on TV. How many bodies? Three, the Detective Percy said. So those counting the two we found previously puts us officially in serial killer territory. You think there are others? Possibly. We're still searching the basement and backyard. You did a good thing tonight, you know. I killed a man. There was a tremor in my voice. It was in self-defense, yeah, but I still killed him. And the world is now better off. Detective Percy glanced over his shoulder. Isn't that right, Jimmy? Detective Huston just nodded. So why am I here anyway? I asked. Am I under arrest? No, of course not. Did you just hear me? You're a hero. As far as we're concerned, you should get the fucking key to the city. Detective Percy was overdoing it. Trying, to, trying too hard to be my friend, to act like nothing bad was coming my way. And who knows, maybe it was the truth. But I had been in this room for nearly three hours, which gave me a lot of time to think and process recent events and decide on the best course of action which, now that the two detectives were finally in the room, was still unclear. So then, I'm free to leave? The smile slipped off the detective's face. Not quite. First, we want to get your side of things. I've already given my statement. Yes, and that was much appreciated. Wasn't it, Jimmy? De De detective Huston grunted his agreement. Fine, I said. What do you guys want to know? Simple. Tell us how this all started. I first met Norman Jones on a Friday afternoon. 
I know for a fact it was Friday because Fridays I went down to the library with my laptop and found a quiet corner where I wouldn't be bothered and spent several hours working on whatever I was currently working on. I had seen Norman a few times before. The city library is a magnet for the homeless and eccentric. I knew most of the staff by name and I knew most of the regulars by face. They'd wander the narrow aisles or flip through months old magazines or page through yesterday's paper, scanning every article as if they might recognize their own names, despite the fact many of them probably couldn't read. Norman, however, was different. He clearly wasn't homeless. He was well-groomed, though his gray hair was sometimes ragged and his full beard unkempt. He'd wear chinos and a button-down shirt, always tucked in, and his glasses were always perched just so on his nose that you knew he took great care of them. Like I said, I had seen him a couple of times, but it wasn't until a few months passed that he first spoke to me. Writing anything good? I looked up at him over my laptop screen. He forced a smile. You're a writer, aren't you? I nodded absently, annoyed at the interruption. I'm a writer too, he extended his hand. The name's Norman, Norman Jones. Good to meet you. We shook. So what do you write, he asked. Any particular genre? I wanted him to leave, but I didn't want to be rude either. It went against my nature, despite all the times rudeness would have come in handy. Mystery, I told him. Then, well, more crime, I guess. He smiled again. There is a distinction, isn't there? I nodded, hoping he wouldn't make this short. Fortunately, he did. He said it was nice meeting me. He said he wished me great luck on my story. He said he might see me around some other time. Then he wandered away, and I turned my focus back on my work. I expected to see him the next Friday, but it was two Fridays later that we ran into each other. Literally. I had finished and packed my laptop and was starting up the stairs of the first floor when I went around the corner and ran into someone coming down the steps. This person was gripping the railing and let go in surprise. He started to fall back. I reached out and grabbed him before he fell. My goodness, Norman Jones said, breathless. That was certainly a close call. I'm sorry about that. He shook his head. Not at all. Stairs can be a great tool, but also a dangerous tool. A moment of awkward silence passed. Well, sorry again, I said, and started up past him up the stairs. Did you ever finish your story? I reached the top of the stairs and turned back. What story? The one you were working on last time we spoke. Y yes. I'd love to read it sometime. I wasn't sure what to say to this. As a professional writer, I have no problem letting re strangers read my work. But usually those strangers are readers finding my stuff in bookstores or magazines or online. Almost never does a stranger ask to read something that hasn't yet been published, something that, quite honestly, was still a first draft. It's um, finished, but it's not really finished, if that makes sense. He smiled and nodded. Of course, of course. Well, once it is finished, I'd love to read it. Sure, I told him, but I had no intentions of showing him the story. In fact, I decided right there and then I won't be returning to the library. Not next week, not the following week. I had only been coming to the library to get out of my apartment. It was a nice change of scenery, but the city was big and I knew I could easily find scenery elsewhere. Not even a month passed before I ran into him again. Not at the library, I had stopped going, but at the bookstore downtown. I was browsing the shelves when I turned the corner and there he stood, paging through a book. Hello, he said, before I had a chance to turn away. I returned the greeting. Then, not having anything else to say, I asked him what he was looking at. He showed me the cover. It was American Pastoral by Philip Roth. He asked, have you ever read it? I have. Is it as good as everybody says it is? It, it is. He smiled thoughtfully. Then you've convinced me this is today's purchase. Today's? Yes, I purchase a book every day. Don't you? I laughed. I wish. Tell me, did you ever finish your story to your satisfaction? I did what I could with it. It's as good as it's ever going to get. So it's not perfect? I shook my head. There is no such thing as a perfect story. Ah, uh, Robert, but that's where you're wrong. As far as I know, I never gave him my name. That should have been my first warning. Actually, my first warning should have been running into him at the bookstore. Granted, there aren't that many bookstores in the city, and yes, this one was one of the more popular ones, but what were the chances I would run into him here after having literally run into him weeks before at the library? Or maybe I was just being paranoid. Chances were he was a fan. My picture was on my website. It was rare, but readers sometimes recognized me. How do you know my name? He smiled. It seemed he was always smiling. You told me when we first met. I gave you my name, you gave me your name. And that's usually how introductions work, yes? I still didn't remember giving him my name, but I admitted that yes, that was how introductions worked. From there, Norman talked about some of the books he liked, and I talked about some of the books he liked. 
or I talked about some of the books I liked, and the tension that seemed to be there, at least on my side, quickly faded. Norman Jones was, I had to admit, a fairly nice and affable guy. He seemed sharp, too, and when he mentioned that he had attended Harvard, that he had taught English at Stanford for nearly a decade, I began letting down my defenses. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was because for several years I had been university-minded, having attended an MFA program. I had done my work and received my degree, and now I spent my days not teaching like my peers, but locked up in my apartment, staring at my computer screen. I was a full-time writer, which was what I had always wanted to be, but it had come with a price. Countless hours spent by myself. No friends besides the few I knew online and in writing circles. No consistent girlfriends. My, my parents lived across the country, and I hardly ever saw them. So, as pathetic as it sounded, I was lonely and unconsciously looking for a friend, and with my defenses down like they were, Norman Jones seemed to be the right fit. Do you drink coffee? I asked. We ended up at a coffee shop a few blocks away, and it was there that we continued our discussion about books and writing and, well, the usual stuff writers talk about when they get together. So tell me about the perfect story. What about it? I maintain it doesn't exist. And why is that? Just because. Writing and reading and sub are such sub subjective things. What one person likes, another person will dislike or hate or just be indifferent about. There, there, isn't, there isn't any story or novel or even poem that is universally liked by everyone. Smiling, Norman took a sip of his beer. A perfect story doesn't mean it's universally liked. Then what does it mean? He shrugged, just that it's perfect. Right, so what does it even mean? Norman laughed a deep, hearty chuckle. Oh, Robert, where should I even begin? Our friendship started there, I suppose. I didn't see him all the time, but usually once a week we met for coffee or to browse books, and I would bring along the latest thing I had written, and Norman would read it right there in front of me, a pen in hand, and mark up the pages as he went along. The thing about writers, we're an insecure bunch. We want everyone to like what we write, but know at the same time everyone is just as likely to hate it. The idea of sitting within close proximity of someone reading what you wrote with the intention of pointing out its flaws is cringeworthy. And yet, for some reason, when Norman read and marked my stories right in front of me, I wasn't nervous. The first time, yes, but after I had gone through his notes, saw his comments and his corrections, I realized he knew what he was talking about. Most times when someone gives me feedback, I agree with that person less than half the time. Here I agreed with Norman 100% of the time and impressed me so deeply I asked him why he, I hadn't read any of his work. In due time. So you're working on something? Of course, I've been working on it for quite a while. And what is that? He smiled. The perfect story. I don't want to bore you with many more details. You know how it ends. You know, how, who, who, you know who Norman Jones turned out to be. Truthfully, I thought of him as a friend. I never would have imagined he was capable of doing what he did. Never once did he say or do anything that sent up red flags. Obviously, now I knew better. That, from the very start, he was stalking me, following my every move, confirming that I was a loner with hardly any friends or family, so that when I did go missing, it wouldn't raise too many eyebrows. I mean, sure, there's my agent and publisher and all my readers, but it's not like I'm close to any of them. All my communication is through email or phone. If I just happened to disappear one day, it would be a week or more before anyone noticed. I'm a mid-list writer, and mid-list writers are a dime a dozen. Or a dime a thousand, really. Eventually, someone would contact my parents. They would fly out, or maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they would get in contact with the super at my building. He would let himself into my apartment. He would find it empty. Nothing disturbed. Or, who knows, maybe Norma would have a letter there explaining I had just run off. I mean, how do you do it with the others? Right. You don't know how they you don't know who they are just yet. But still, they no doubt had friends and family, and then one day they just disappeared. People became worried. They tried finding them until they eventually lost hope. I figure it would have been the same with me. At least until I killed Norman Jones before he had a chance to kill me. As you know, Norman lived in a house on the east side of the city. We had known each other for maybe three months before he invited me over. But we didn't go inside. He apologized, saying the place was a mess. So we sat out on the porch and drank coffee and watched the traffic and people on the sidewalk and just talked about the usual stuff. So when can I read it? Norman knew exactly what I meant. Soon, he said. I smiled and laughed. What's so funny? You're really serious about this, aren't you? I told you it's possible. But it's not. I figure someone of your intellect should know better. I mean, Christ, you graduate from Harvard. I thought all you eggheads were supposed to be smart. Name calling now, Robert? 
fine, sorry. But you can't honestly believe that you've written the perfect story. You're right, I haven't, he smiled. At least not yet. Yes, I now know this perfect story Norman kept talking about was simply his way of luring me into his house. Just as a pervert lures children into his van with candy. Only, you know what? Children love candy, and writers love the idea of a perfect story. Rationally, we know it's impossible, that there's just no way the perfect story exists, but still, we have hope. That's why we keep doing what we do. What day, why day after day we go through the torture of sitting in front of a computer and forcing ourselves to type letters which will form words, which will form paragraphs, which will, hopefully, form a, co co a coherent story. We want to entertain, no doubt about that, but mostly we strive to tell the best story we can. And, if possible, we'd love for that story to be perfect. So, yes, I fell for it. Not at first, of course. I kept up a healthy level of skepticism, at least until the day Norman told me he had finally completed his story. This, as you know, was just yesterday. We were sitting on his front porch, sipping coffee and watching traffic. Then, finally, Norman cleared his throat and made his announcement. I've done it. What's that? The perfect story. I've completed it. When? Just last night. Would you care to see it? Well, of course I did. I told him to bring it right out. Norman shook his head. He said that unlike me, he didn't use a computer. He couldn't simply press a button and wait for a printer to spit out pages. He was a typewriter, and Underwood touched Master 5, so there was only one copy of the story. He didn't want to take the chance of bringing all those pages, all those pages on which he had worked tirelessly and endlessly, outside where they might scatter into the wind. Not that he didn't trust me, he assured, but nature was a fickle beast, and he just didn't want to take the chance. So, he said, clearly embarrassed, the place isn't as tidy as I would like it to be, but you're welcome to come inside. That is, of course, if you still want to see the story. I was on my feet before I even knew it. Let's go. For some reason, I was thinking he would have trash turned everywhere, like he was one of those hoarders you see on TV. As you know, that was far from the truth. Well, I guess in a way he was a hoarder, though, wasn't he? Just not with useless crap. There were books everywhere. On shelves, yes, but on the floor, too. Stacks nearly as tall as me. Thousands and thousands and thousands of books. Holy shit, Norman chuckled. I told you I bought a book every day. Sometimes I buy more than one. He led me through the stacks of books toward the back of the house. The farther we went, the more I began to smell it. Initially, I had been overcome with the tang of all that paper in one place. People like to say they love the smell of books, but after smelling all that paper in that place... The fond, welcoming scent that recalls long, dedicated hours of working in a library, or the joy of browsing a second-hand bookstore looking for copies of my own out-of-print titles will forever be associated with the nausea that came up to the back of my throat. But as we neared the back of the house, I began to smell something off. I still wasn't sure what it was as we reached the kitchen, which also had books stacked everywhere. Norman went to the basement door, and it was as he opened it that it really hit me. My God, I said, holding my nose, what is that smell? A pipe burst just the other day. I put in a call for a plumber, but they haven't come out yet. He held the door open and motioned for me to go down. I shook my head. Why don't you bring the, papers, why don't you bring the pages up here? Don't you want to see my workspace? You work in your basement? Is that so hard to believe? If I remember correctly, when our paths first crossed, you were typing on your laptop in the basement of the library. He had me there. Breathing through my mouth, I braced myself for the stench and began to descend the stairs. When I reached the bottom, I saw this was indeed his workspace. There was a desk set up with an Underwood Touch Master 5, just like Norman said. A desk lamp sat beside the typewriter. Papers were scattered across the desk and on the floor. But that, as you know, was hardly anything. The rest of the basement was filled with canvases, over 100 of them spread out around the basement, leaning against walls and each other. They had once been blank, but now each had an eerie face drawn in maroon paint. While the faces all looked different, they all somehow looked the same. One canvas was close to me, and I took a hesitant step forward, squinting at the paint. Only, I realized a second later, it wasn't paint. What the hell? I started to turn back when I realized Norman was right behind me. He had a knife in his hand, raised above his head. He brought it down, aiming for my throat. I sidestepped him, spitting away. He stumbled forward, then regained his footing, turned and rushed at me. Fight or flight, I had never truly experienced it until then. There was an instant when I considered fighting the old man, but the glint of the knife in his hands forced me to give up that illusion. I fled up the stairs. Norman, despite his old age, was just as fast. He scrambled up the stairs after me, and it was as I reached the top that he reached out and grabbed my leg. 
I had just enough time to glance back and see him with a knife in his other hand. The, the knife was arcing down toward my leg. I knew once it penetrated my skin, I was done. I may still be able to crawl away, but Norma would have the advantage. He would pull the knife back out and stab me again and again and again. Nothing would stop him. So I did the only thing I could think to do. I kicked him in the face. He teetered for an instant, a pen standing on its tip, and then fell back. He may have cried out, I'm not sure. By then, blood was pounding away in my ears. But he fell and kept falling right down the stairs until he hit the bottom. For a moment or two, I didn't move. I didn't breathe. I just stood there, staring, until I realized the old man wasn't getting back up. The angle of his neck and his suddenly blank eyes confirmed this. Norman Jones was dead. Detective Percy asked, and then you called 911? I nodded, and then I called 911. Detective Percy glanced back at Detective Huston, silently asking if he had anything else to add or ask. Detective Huston, staying true to his bad cop demeanor, didn't say a word. All right then, Mr. Swartwood, Detective Percy said with a sigh. I think that will do for now. If we have any further questions, we'll give you a call. I pushed away from the table and stood up. I started toward the door. Detective Huston stared me down. His face was a blank slate. I thought about picking my nose and wiping it on his shirt just to get a reaction, but I decided that might be too much. Detective Percy's voice stopped me. Oh, one more thing. Of course. All those papers scattered around the desk and the floor, the detective said, were blank. None of them had any writing on it, so where do you think it went? Where do I think what went? The guy's quote-unquote perfect story. I smiled. Detective Percy didn't seem to like that. What's so funny? Haven't you figured it out yet? There was no story. The perfect story doesn't exist. Except it does. Or might. I'm still not completely sure. I left the detectives and went home. They offered, me to, they offered to have someone drive me, but I said I would walk. I needed the fresh air. I needed time to myself. I needed to run through once more what truly happened in that house. The story I gave the detectives wasn't 100% accurate. I'm a writer, after all, and it's been my nature to tell stories. Besides, I had three hours to think things over. I had considered telling them the truth, but I knew just as well that they wouldn't believe me. If anything, they would have shipped me off to the mental institution, because this is what really happened. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I saw this was indeed his workspace. There was a desk set up with an Underwood Touchmaster 5. A desk lamp sat beside the typewriter. Papers were scattered across the desk and on the floor, but that was hardly anything. The rest of the basement was filled with canvases. Over 100 of them spread out around the basement, leaning against walls and each other. They had once been blank, but now each had an eerie face drawn in maroon paint. While the faces all looked different, they all looked the same. One canvas was close to me, and I took a hesitant step forward, squinting down at it. Only it wasn't paint. What the hell? Norman stepped beside me. His hands were clasped behind his back. He stared down at the canvas and whispered, Do you see it? I said nothing. I couldn't, my voice suddenly stolen, because the eerie face on the canvas was moving. The eyes blinked and looked up at me, then at Norman. The lips began to move slightly, the corners rising in a smile. Norman's voice became a reverent whisper. Isn't she beautiful? What? What is that? That, my dear boy, is my muse. I looked at him, tearing my gaze from the canvas. Your muse? Of course. Every great writer needs a muse. A muse is what inspires. A muse is what keeps our motivation going. A great muse, my muse, allows me to write the perfect story. I started backing away toward the stairs. Where are you going? I'm leaving. You can't. She won't let you. Who? I asked, but already I knew. Because the face on that one canvas wasn't moving anymore. They all were. Every face was watching me. Every set of eyes blinked. Every corner of every mouth began to drop into a frown. Norman took a step toward me, his empty hands held out in front of him. Robert, please, don't make this any harder on yourself than it needs to be. You're a talented writer. The others were talented writers, too. It was because of their talent that I was able to continue my story. I'm almost done now, so very close. She has been guiding me all this time. She says I need just one more sacrifice and the story will be complete. You're fucking insane. I turned away and started up the steps when suddenly my feet disappeared from beneath me. I was weightless in the air for a moment before hitting the ground hard. I looked over my shoulder and saw Norman was several feet away. No way he could have grabbed me like that from that distance. She doesn't want you to leave, Robert. She won't allow it. I climbed to my feet, my body now trembling. Norman took another step forward. Please, Robert, don't fight it. Make it easy on yourself. The others who fought died very painfully. I don't want the same to happen to you. I backed up, placing one foot on the step. Stay away from me. She won't let you leave. 
Why can't you accept that? The faces on the canvas watched us, their eyes shifting from Norman to me. Is that what her face really looks like? Norman smiled, turning his attention to the closest canvas. I used the distraction to bolt up the steps. I was halfway to the top when I felt the hands grabbing at me. There wasn't one or two or even three. There were several hands, a dozen or more, and their phantom fingers dug into my arms, into my back, into my shoulders. They slowed my progress, trying to pull me back down into the basement, but I fought them as best as I could, holding on tight to the railing, putting a foot on one step, then, then another. Don't fight her, Norman said somewhere behind me. His voice sounded close. I refused to look back. You will only make her angry. The hands increased their grip. Excuse me. And just as suddenly, I heard a strange whispering. It was, like a it was like the voice was coming from all directions. A woman's voice, so low and soft I could barely hear what she was saying. Norman began to ascend the stairs. Robert, please, for your own good, stop fighting her. I was almost at the top. The door was right there. I knew once I opened it and stepped into the cluttered kitchen, the hands would release me. How I knew this, I wasn't sure, but I believed it so strongly I kept moving forward. Norman's footsteps were steady as he climbed the stairs, almost to me now. The hands wouldn't let go. They squeezed even harder. I closed my eyes against the pain, clenched my teeth. The last thing I wanted to do was cry out. Robert, Norman's voice right behind me. Just let go and let it all be over as soon as you know. Just let go and it will all be over as soon as you know it. I opened my eyes, stared straight ahead, thought for a moment, and then nodded and let go. All at once, the dozen or more hands released me. The whispering stopped. I turned and round and faced Norman, who stood two steps below me. Stairs are a dangerous tool, I said, and kicked him in the face. As he tumbled down the steps, he made no noise. But the voice started up again. This time it screamed. I clamped my hands over my ears and watched Norman Jones fall to his death. Just like I told the detectives, he landed at the bottom, his neck bent at an, at an unnatural angle. His eyes stared blankly. And then, all at once, the screaming stopped. Hesitantly, I pulled my hands away from my ears. Silence. I opened the basement door and stepped into the kitchen. I knew I needed to call the police. I also knew they weren't going to believe what, I, what just happened. Hell, I was having a hard time accepting it. So I did as any writer who makes his living making up stories did. I came up with a story. In the kitchen, I found a dishcloth and a large butcher knife. Using the cloth so I wouldn't leave any fingerprints, I headed back down into the basement. I did so slowly, cautiously, knowing I, could hightail it, I should hightail it out of there. But what, whatever had been in there before, Norman's muse, was now gone. I was sure of it. I put the knife in Norman's dead hand, used the dishcloth to have the hand grip the knife so his fingerprints would be on the handle. Then I set the knife a few feet away, where I believed it would have landed during his fall. If anything came back to bite me later, it would be the placement of the knife. If it were too close to his body, the police would question it. If it were too far, they would question it. It, had, it needed to be just right. After that, I approached the desk. I was conscious of the blood-painted faces watching me. I looked at, at every canvas as I approached the desk, ready to sprint the stairs if, if any one of, one of them blinked. There were papers scattered on the desk and on the floor, but it was the pile of papers beside the typewriter that I needed, maybe 30, 40 pages in all, a short stack, the only pages that had words typed on them. I grabbed the entire stack and went upstairs. I headed toward the front, reconsidered, then headed toward the back. Here was the backyard. A gate led into the alley. Taking a chance, I went that way. I prayed nobody saw me. I slipped into the alley, walked three blocks until I found a trash can in another alley. I stored the papers under the trash can. Then I returned through the alley to Norman's house. I pulled out my cell phone and dialed 911. The papers were exactly where I left them. Of course they were. Norman's muse wouldn't have let anything happen to them. After all, the story was, wasn't complete. The muse wanted a final sacrifice. It wanted blood. And what did I want? Why had I taken a risk and hidden these pages? Why was I taking a risk and returning for them? The answer was obvious, wasn't it? Every writer strives to write the perfect story. Even if he can't write the perfect story, a writer will do whatever he can to at least get a glimpse of it. And now here it was, what existed of the perfect story. I saw the words typed on the front page, but I refused to allow myself to read them, not even the title. Shadows began to move around the alleyway. The whispering started up, telling me to read the story, telling me that I could be the blessed one who finished it. I reached in my pocket and pulled out a lighter. The shadows increased their movement as soon as they understood what I meant to do. The whispering turned into shouting. Those hands grabbed at me again, the phantom fingers digging into my body, but they weren't strong enough. I lit a flame and put the flame under the stack of pages. Fire began to consume them at once. As the story burned, the hands faded away. 
The shadows and whispering began to lose their intensity. I dropped the story to the ground, slipped the lighter back into my pocket. The shadows and whispering were fading even more, though I heard one word asked again and again, why? But I didn't answer. If the muse needed to ask, it wouldn't even understand if I explained it. And so I stood there for another minute, watching, the pages watching as the pages curled and blackened and turned into ash, and then I headed home. I was hungry and I was exhausted, but when I returned to my apartment, the first thing I did was open my laptop. When inspiration calls, you can't ignore it. Cracking my fingers, I spread them out across the keyboard and began to type.